You're listening to The Real Short Box, a comic book podcast made for geeks by geeks. Hello, everybody, and thank you for listening to The Real Short Box. My name is Donald. And my name is Kevin. And we are here today to talk a little bit about Halloween time, a.k.a. horror comics. Ooh, spooky, right, Kevin? Are you scared? I am shaking in my boots. It smells like you shit yourself. Did you shit yourself you got so scared? No, no, not quite. Not quite? Okay. Well, we want to talk a little bit about a few comics here real quick. Uh, this is probably going to be a short pod uh, on, on horror comics, because uh, let's be honest, uh, horror comics are a mixed bag. They don't often sell that well when they come out. Um, it's more niche. I think superheroes is still the best-selling thing. Uh, some image books do pretty well. I think that um, one of my favorite horror comics uh, from most recent times would be Nailbiter. Oh, really? Tell me about it. You ever heard of Nailbiter, Kevin? I've heard of it, but I haven't read it. Well, Nailbiter was a series. Um, came out, uh, I don't know, probably about four or five years back, I believe. And um, it was about this guy uh, that was a... Um, a bad guy. He was a serial killer, supposedly. And what he did was he would bite the nails off of his victims, a.k.a. call himself the, the nail biter. Now, this was written by Joshua Williamson uh, and uh, Mike Henderson with art uh, by Mike Henderson. Uh, it was a pretty cool idea, to be honest. Uh, it was basically centered around a fictional town of Buckaroo, Oregon. Which I always thought was kind of cool. Buckaroo, Oregon. Right. It, they produced in that in the time uh, of Buckaroo, Oregon's existence. They had produced 16 of the U.S.'s worst serial killers. Now, its most recent one was the uh, Edward Charles Warren, who the guy I was talking about, the nail biter, uh, due to his uh, predilection for, you know, he enjoyed chewing the, the fingernails off of his victims. Series starts um, an FBI agent named Charles Carroll. Um, was investigating the the, the recent uh, spring ups of these serial killers, and then uh, he went missing. So his um, his buddy, his partner, his old partner, that uh, got taken off the force due to some temperamental issues, uh, he then goes into the town to investigate, and it leads you down a winding road of who's good, who's bad. Is the main villain actually the villain, or is he a good guy? Uh, was he falsely accused? Uh, you know, who the real killer is, what are these other demonic, like, beings around town, who are they really, uh, it's just a really cool idea of taking the idea of a town that creates serial killers, instead of, uh, there actually being a couple or something, there's 16 serial killers coming from this town. I don't know, that just kind of rang out to me. I thought it was a really cool idea and a really cool concept. Did they ever try to do an analysis as to why that is? Without spoiling anything, yes. And you do get to know why that happened, the way it happened. Hmm. Um, you also get to know a little backstory about pretty much all of the 16 serial killers. Uh, and every so many, so often in every other issue or so, they talk about uh, a particular serial killer and why, you know, what drove them over the edge and why. And you kind of see a little bit of how they, you know, what they did to become the serial killer. Right. So it's uh, we'll pushed them in that direction, right? So it's a pretty cool idea behind it. Uh, those guys did. A, I thought they did a really bang up job. Uh, how many issues is the run? I think it was forty something. Forty, I think. Did it have a you know a good conclusion? Did it make sense? Did it, did they tie everything up nice and neat? You know, they tied it up the best they could. But um, to be to be honest, uh, not not to my liking. The ending was a little bit lackluster, and I think it's because he. Uh, Williamson didn't really want, I don't know if he wanted to end it or if he was just running out of ideas or running out of steam, but the way he ended it, uh, it left it in an almost open-ended type of way. And he even said that he might go back to the story eventually, like, you know, um, Nail Biter 2 or, you know. Some kind whatever. of follow-up. Yeah, Toe Biter. I don't know. The toe Biter. <laughs> you know, you, the Toe Nibbler. Uh, there be, you go. That'd be pretty disturbing if you're being murdered by someone in there and start nibbling on your toes. Nibbling on your toes. Yeah, I'd be really disturbed. That's the last thing you see before you go. That's a little more sexual than I'd like it to be, but yeah. hey, you know, whatever. 
You like nibbling toes? You'll love the toe nibbler. Oh, jeez. <laughs> but yeah, so that was a that was a favorite one of mine in recent memory. Do you have one that, you know, maybe comes to mind? Um, probably about six, seven years ago, there was one called Severed. I'm trying to remember it vaguely because you should bring mm. this up now. Think of it as an image mm -hmm. title. I think it was like seven issues, seven or eight issues. Who wrote that? I'm trying to remember who did it. Was, write uh, it was was it Snyder? Yes, I know what I think it was Scott Snyder. I think I think that I think when he would be in between Batman and Swamp Thing during that time period when he was working on the, on the new fifty two. I think that's he may have been working on that as a separate personal project. At yeah. Im at image. Yeah, I think I think it was written by him, um, by Snyder. Uh, that one was a. Uh... He was a 12-year-old kid, I think, or 13, maybe he was 14, I don't know. He was yeah, a young kid. young kid. Ran away from home. Yeah, foolishly. And he met with a, uh, he met a traveling salesman, right? Yeah, traveling salesman. And that traveling salesman, salesman was wasn't creepy. quite who we thought he was. No, a little creepy. Yeah, a little, a little too creepy, yeah. Um, it was Scott Snyder and uh, Scott Tuft, I believe, and Attila Futaki. Yeah, the artwork was pretty good. It was a, it was a good comic book. Uh, it was a great idea. It was a great... Great for a mini series, you know. You wouldn't want it to be anything more. Yeah, you wouldn't want it to be any more than what it was. You know, when it got to the point, you know, the ending was uh, quite interesting, <laughs> to say the least. Especially the fate of the little boy. Felt bad for the kid, but you know what? He somewhat brought it upon himself. Kind of oh, get poor kid. Kind of get a little too smart for his britches, as they say. Yeah. So he met up with that traveling salesman. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he had like, didn't he have like something like something under his teeth or something, or he hit his teeth? Yes, he did. Because he had like monster teeth. Yes, he did. Yeah, and then like weird hands or some shit. He was almost like a demon. Yeah. In a way. Yeah, kind of like a real life walking and, demon. And this kid starts to find out along the way with this guy that you know. And I remember he was kind of entranced by the salesman. You know, he was really feeling him. Like, oh man, this guy's really cool. You know, he's really nice. You know, he's staying over with him and whatnot. And you know, little by little, he learns the creepy unfortunate things behind the scenes mm -hmm. kind of like you shouldn't go into that house kid mm -mm. never go into a house that uh that a salesman tells you to go into i guess <laughs> uh it's it's a hard one to discuss because there's so many things that could be spoiled with it yes so just know if uh, if you're listening out there we keep that, it big for a reason right it's it's just it's it's one of those stories you've got to read yourself, but it is, it, honestly... It, it builds up to a, you know, <laughs> an interesting conclusion. Right, and it is an awesome little horror short story. I really enjoyed that one. So good, good call on that one, Kevin. Thank you. I completely put that one on the back burner in my mind, but yeah, that's a great one. Oh, sorry to interrupt, everyone. Just wanted to mention real quick about a shop in Canoga Park, California called Spiro's Heroes. Elliot, the proprietor of the store, has over 300,000 books in what's called the Temple of Comics. That's Spiro Heroes in Canoga Park. SpiroHeroes.com. There's, there's another one that I was thinking of. This one's been out for a little bit, but um, it's an interesting idea. Uh, have you ever heard of a comic book called Crossed, Kevin? Oh, yeah. I think I have a couple of those issues. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty much out there. Yeah, written, uh, it was created by Garth Ennis and Jason Burroughs. Is that from, like, Avatar? Um, even Alan Moore, uh, Sears Superior, and uh, David Lapham. They all uh, contributed to the stories. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong, is that Avatar Press? I'm trying to remember which, which independent company makes those, those books. Um, yeah, it is, it is. It's a Avatar, I think is the name of it, or something like that. I think they also did another one that was, like, this other quirky title. It was, like, this guy who couldn't be killed. It was, like... What was it called? Something the Unkillable. This, this guy looks like, uh, what's that porn star with the mustache? The old classic. What's that fella? He's got the chubby dude with the mustache. The, the old, Oh, Ron Jeremy? Ron Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah, the comic book character, he looks a lot like Ron Jeremy, but just, just a little bit taller. Mm. But he's called, like, uh, Something the Unkillable. It's kind of funny. I, I, oh, Dan the Unharmable? There we go. Dan the Unharmable. Yeah. That's kind of like a funny, quirky story boy yeah but that that gets gross too it's yeah. a lot of gross stuff to that one it does but it's from the same you know yeah company. avatar i think is what it was or something yeah like they do that. a lot like, like, like a lot of their titles are very kind of gross out especially cross cross is just crazy very graphic you it, it, put, it puts even walking dead to shame in some in some respects when it comes to the graphic horror of mm -hmm. them, especially the way it's drawn out now i'm going to read off to you because I, I think they do it the best here this is a plot synopsis for crossed 
story follows survivors dealing with a pandemic that causes its victims to carry out their most evil thoughts. Mm -hmm. So carriers of the virus are generally known as the crossed due to a large cross-like rash that appears on their faces. Other names include cross faces and plus faces. This contagion is primarily spread through bodily fluids, which the cross have used to great effect by treating their weapons with their fluids, as well as through other forms of direct fluidic contact, such as rape and bites, assuming the victims live long enough to turn. A major difference between a cross and other fictional zombie or insanity virus type epidemics is that while a cross are turned into homicidal violent psychopaths, they still retain a basic human level of intelligence. Thus, they are still capable of using firearms and tools, driving cars, uh, setting complex traps, and other actions. It is occasionally noted in the series that a cross, uh, cross retains any skills they had prior to their infection. Most simply, lack the patience or sanity to do anything not immediately related to their vicious impulses. Uh, the contagion spread across the entire world with crossed killing, raping, engaging in cannibalism, and maiming for fun, with government and military overwhelmed, friends and family butchered each other with anything they can lay their hands on. Uh, much of the Middle East was wiped out when Israel deployed nuclear weapons. The last organized act by the U.S. government was to shut down as many nuclear um, power plants as possible and then kill the nuclear scientists and technicians to prevent them from reactivating the plants. Mm -hmm. A few nuclear power plants were not reached in time, however, such as Wolf Creek in Kansas and Brown Ferry in Alabama, detonated by Cross, who removed the control rods. One by one, the remaining military bases are overrun. Soon, soon human civilians is all but civilization is all but gone, and mankind is an increasingly endangered species. So it's kind of like uh, Mad Max meets uh, The Walking Dead. But just to an extreme. Yeah, just to an extreme. Like, they're living out their impulses, so if it's like, if you see some, you know, attractive-looking person, man or woman, and let's say you're a man or a woman, and you see that attractive-looking person, you're like, man, I wonder what it would be like to have relations with them. And you're going to take it to the extreme. As a cross, you would just go over and extreme. do it. Yep, take it to the which extreme. Which is freaky. Or uh, if you or, have a bias towards certain people you've been holding back your whole life, yep. and all of a sudden now, oh, I'm going to kill this you person. You don't have that anymore. Yeah. Or let's say um, you're my neighbor, and you have a nice car, and I want that car. I'm just going to take it. I'm just going to take it. And if I'll, you get I'll, I'll, I'll kill, kill you. I'll kill you. I'll right? kill you to get it, right. because I don't care. I right. want that car. That is the object of my desire. Yep. So, yeah, I can see how like the normal people that aren't infected would basically, you would almost have to turn into them. You would have to kill or be killed. And, and that's the environment that it would put you in. So you see nihilism taken to its final stage. Yeah. And you know when Garth Ennis is behind something. It's never going to be anything pretty. Nope. You know, it's always something kind of freaky and vicious and scary. Yeah. I could, honestly, I could see Crossed as a... Um, can't be a TV show in a sense. Cause it, I think if you put it on HBO, it would be just be considered so extreme. I think you could put it on there. I just don't think you could do a lot of the stuff that they've already gotten away with in comic books. Yeah. Because if you look at The Walking Dead, for instance, there's they a lot more things graphic things. things. Yeah. They so things basically, if The Walking Dead should have been meant for HBO and ends up right. on AMC, right. then Crossed shouldn't be meant for television and can end up on HBO. Right. If that makes sense. Because there, there's more things you can get away with on HBO than you could, right. say, you know, AMC FX. FX or something like that. Yeah. Absolutely. See, the thing is, you can't even do a movie, really, because I hate to say it, it would have to be NC-17. Mm -hmm. It can't even be an R-rated movie. It would have to be NC-17, because, because with, with just with the vicious... Uh, basically, it's, a, it's an NC-17 comic book. Right. I mean, it's just so out there. Every vile evil you can think of is being committed in those books. Mm-hmm. Um, do you remember that uh, there, there was that other one uh, similar to that? It had to. I think it had to do with werewolves, though. Feral, I think, is what it was called. Mm -hmm. And they had to do with... It was a small town, and there was werewolves attacking and stuff. That was a recent one that came to mind, too. That uh, I don't I don't think I've read any of it, or if I have, I've read the first issue or something, and it just seemed like something I would be down for. But I never went back to it to check it out. But um, it seems like the independent comic book companies do the best types of horror because they can get a lot away with a lot more right and they know they're catering to a very specific audience they're not trying to cater to children obviously right and image has done a lot of really good ones um and so has uh avatar and you know a couple others out there 
Uh, even Dark Horse has done some really good horror comics over the years, and, and the inclusion of Predator and Aliens and stuff like that that they've put out there. Uh, I can't remember the company that did the uh, the Freddy versus Jason versus Ash comics, and then I think it was Dynamite that um, Ash uh, Army of Darkness got um, they got the rights to them, and it ended up with them, and uh, that was that was a decent run too. Originally, though, I can't remember the Army of Darkness series. It was like a based on the movie type mini series or something. I can't remember the company that churned those out, but there was like three. It might have been Dark Horse, to be honest. Uh, actually, I think it was Dark Horse, because Dark Horse back then they were doing a lot of, and they still do adaptations. Yeah, they do a lot of it for, um, for you know, properties and stuff, and they'll you know like Firefly and, and stuff, Serenity and. Uh, Aliens, of course, and Predator, and Avatar, and, you know, all that stuff. The Last Airbender. They do a lot of those adaptations. But uh, they did a lot of movie ones, too, back in the day. I think The Mask. They did The Mask. Yeah, it was one of them as well. And uh, Dark Man. I think, I think they did... I don't know if they did the Dark Man one. I think that might have been Marvel, surprisingly. Marvel did some weird adaptations, too. They even did a Meteor Man one that we've, yeah, sorry, we've, we've talked, talked about, about before. Yeah. <laughs> But as far as horror comics are concerned, I feel like you, you can't mention how good horror comics are or how far along they've gotten without mentioning EC. Of course. And that st stood for an entertaining comic. Am I correct? I believe so. Yeah. So EC Comics, this was in the 50s. They created the horror comics, basically. I mean, they were the ones that pioneered it. They were the ones that that made it so repulsive to people that they literally got the government involved to stop these comic books from being created. I, I think a lot of fear. The straw that broke the camel's back wasn't it the one issue with the guy that had the axe and the woman's head in his hand. Yep, that's a famous one. Yeah, that was the one that kind of put it over the edge. Little kids reading those type stories. And of course, unfortunately, this is one of the classic versions of judging a book by its cover. Mm -hmm. Because had those parents actually read the stories, they'd understand that these villains got their comeuppance. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't just get away with it. It came back to haunt them. So anytime they did some wrong, they killed someone, they cheated some, someone out of something, it would come back around to destroy them. So that way you're teaching the kids that there's a price to pay for doing evil amongst others or, or doing evil upon others. Right, yeah, they had a lot of that. And then it got... Um... It got the Comics Code Authority stepped in, and they're like, no, 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 we're not doing this. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. It basically almost put EC out of business if it wasn't for Mad Magazine. Mad Magazine. Mad Magazine kept him afloat. Mad Magazine, which I believe is now owned by DC Comics, right? I believe so. Yeah, DC has the rights to that. Um, but it's interesting to see that later in the 70s, the Comics Code seemed to, to lax a little bit. It seemed to I think a lot of that had to do down. because of all the social movements. Mm -hmm. You know, thought things were being relaxed in society and whatnot, and of course the MPAA was created so you could have these different categories of movies. Yeah, um, and I think that was also in the it was a later half of the '60s and the beginning of the '70s. But some of the titles would include uh, Charlton Comics' uh, Ghostly Tales, mm -hmm. also The Many Ghosts of Doctor Graves and Ghost Manor, Marvel Comics' Chamber of Darkness, Monsters on the Prowl, and Tower of uh, Shadows. Also, Creatures on the Loose. And then at DC, they had the new uh, House of Mystery. And uh, a similar transformation was made to the House of Secrets. Uh, and the Unexpected, which was formerly Tales of the Unexpected. And then the Witching Hour, which yes. I remember that one as well. And uh, that's because uh, in 71, the Comics Code Authority, they relaxed some of its long-standing rules regarding horror comics. Um Scenes dealing with or instruments associated with Walking Dead or torture shall not be used. Vampires and ghouls and werewolves shall be permitted to be used when handled in the classic tradition, such as Frankenstein, Dracula, and other high-caliber literary works written by Edgar Allan Poe, uh, Sakai, Conan Doyle, and other respected authors. Hence why Tomb of Dracula was created. Right. And following this, Marvel returned to publishing true horror by first introducing their, <laughs> this is great, how they got away with it, their scientifically created vampire-like character. He wasn't technically a vampire. Yeah, Morbius. Is right. Enough. He was the, Morbius the living vampire. Mm -hmm. uh, that followed by the introduction of Dracula and Tomb of Dracula. 
Um, that so, then created... You know, you know it's kind of like like a decade later, like for Thundercats, Mumra, the ever-living. Yeah. Yeah, they were able to get away with all kinds of stuff. Supernatural thrillers, Werewolf by Night, uh, you know, Ghost Rider, uh, Son of Satan. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in addition, Satan. following Warren Publishing's longtime lead... Marvel's parent company in 1971 began a black and white magazine imprint, which published a number of horror titles, including Dracula Lives, Monsters Unleashed, Vampire Tales, Tales of the Zombie, Haunt of Horror, and Masters of Terror. That's because magazine form wasn't under the Comics right. Code Authority, so they could get away with it. They could market it to older audiences and sell it that way. So a lot of the horror jumped ship from comic to magazine Much form. like graphic novels, you can get to do things outside mm -hmm. the and then DC, during this time, continued to publish supernatural fiction. Uh, Ghosts, The Dark Mansion of Forbidden Love, later titled Forbidden Tales of Dark Mansion. Secrets of Haunted House. Secrets of Sinister House. Swamp Thing. Weird Mystery Tales. Weird War Tales. And Tales of Ghost Castle. And uh, Charlton continued in the vein as well with Ghostly Haunts, Haunted, Midnight Tales, Haunted Love, and Scary Tales. And that, that to me is, uh, you know, that was... A big boom for for the horror industry, of course, because those were allowed to be back in. So horror was coming back, in other words, in, in printed form, and it was becoming more and more popular. So they did a lot of of sales with these horror titles, and that's why it's, a lot of these characters are still in the mainstream today. I mean, Morbius the Living Vampire. There, there's been rumors of him coming up in a Spider-Man movie for years. That's true, and it's because he's a great character. It's a great character, uh, very underdeveloped as far as like the the movie world and, and television and stuff like that. So they could do a lot with him. Uh, Werewolf by Night, Tomb of Dracula, they can do a lot with those characters. In fact, um, they could do so much with these characters that we talked about them putting an imprint under like uh, whether it be Disney with their own banner or Netflix or Amazon Prime or whoever creating these series and, and rolling with it because I mean even Hulu got like, the rights to Runaways, right? I, th I think I gave you an idea. The imprint I, I, the name I came for it was like Marvel Mature. Yeah, Marvel Mature or something like that. Yeah, because um, DC's dark, DC dark, right? And that made sense. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so Marvel DC dark, Mature, Marvel, or, Marvel Mature, or Marvel Monsters, right? You know, even that, something along that, that way, vein. That way, parents who may they, they you can avoid confusion so your child doesn't trick you. Oh, I want to see more, you know? And they like, oh wait, 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 I see that. Yeah, that logo on there. I this isn't this isn't for you, little Johnny. You know that kind of thing. No, but it was interesting because uh, then in the eighties, uh, it, it, you know, in the seventies, you know, there was a, a bit of an oversaturation of horror titles, and things started to go by the wayside. But nineteen eighty two, Pacific Comics. Now that was a company that we've talked about before. Mm -hmm. Very small independent company. They produced two series that, while admittedly inspired by EC Comics in the nineteen fifties foresaw the form that horror comics would take in the coming decades. Printed in color and high-quality paper stock, despite a higher cover price, the series Twisted Tales and Alien Worlds were short-lived and hard-pressed to keep to a regular production schedule, but offered some of the most explicitly brutal and sexual stories yet to be widely distributed in a mainstream, non-underground format. Both series eventually moved to Eclipse Comics, which also produced similar titles such as Twisted Tales of Bruce Jones and Alien Encounters, uh, later horror titles from DC's Vertigo line had more in common with these uh, Pacific Eclipse efforts and more success than DC's sporadic efforts to revive or maintain traditional horror comic title, such as uh, Elvira's House of Mystery. Uh, in 82, DC Comics revived the Swamp Thing series uh, that you know that capitalized on the summer 1982 release of Wes Craven's film of the same name. Hmm. So they revitalized the comic book to go along with the movie that was coming out. So it was. It's interesting how horror still, and it's a it's a big part of the market today now. I mean, we just talked about several crossed and uh, severed, and there's a ton of other ones. Cold, it's cold funny. Hearted, I, was, I think. I was looking it up. Actually, I have half of all the original Twisted Tales comics from Pacific Comics. I didn't realize that. There's only 10 issues. Oh, they only produced 10? Yeah, and I have half of them. I have five. Uh, Dave Stevens, I believe, did some of the art for the... It uh, wasn't the Twisted Tales. It was the other one. Um, uh, da -da -da, what was that name? Um, Alien Worlds. Yeah, that's the one. Dave Stevens did a lot of the, uh, the cover art for that, I believe, for a few... At least three or four, I think, of the issues. And they were beautifully drawn. 
the covers. Yeah, I'm looking at some of them right now to remind myself. Yeah, they're, they're like very realistic, almost frightening realistic. Yeah, Dave Stevens, if, uh, if I'm correct, he knew how to draw a woman uh, as far as like the, the the very curvaceous elegance of a lady to really draw you into the comic, even when it's being silly. I believe there was a, a cover with a, a lady in like an astronaut outfit and then a bunny type character on the cover. And mm-hmm. it was kind of silly, but yet very playful and very... Um, I don't want to say sexually charged, but definitely as a kid, if you saw that, you'd be like, hubba hubba. Right. You know what I mean? It would be like something uh, almost too erotic for a little kid, I guess, in a way. And Bernie Wrightson worked on one of the last issues. Yeah. Yeah, Wrightson did some stuff for uh, for Pacific and I maybe Eclipse. I'm not 100%, but I know he did some stuff for Pacific Comics back in the day uh, before their, their untimely downfall, so to speak. Um, but if we can't, I mean, I grazed over it, but we can't not talk about horror comics and not mention, uh, the Vertigo line. Nope. That started in 1993. DC introduced its mature readers line Vertigo, which folded in, uh, out in a number of popular horror titles, including Hellblazer and Swamp Thing, as well as Neil Gaiman's Sandman. Uh, they also had a number of other horror titles, including Dead Man, House of Mystery, and Haunted Tank. Uh, as well as some kind of offshoots, uh, Kid Eternity and Jonah Hex. And then in the mid-90s, uh, Harris Publications, they revived Vampirilla, which kind of took off from there. Vampirilla is still in, still in publication today. Yeah, and some of her earlier stuff is really sought out yes, by collectors. Yes, yes, it is. Because I believe she first originally appeared in magazine form, if I'm correct, and then made her way to comics. So there's quite a few of characters that have done that. Uh, Man-Thing, for example... Uh, was originally in a magazine and made his way over to comic books. Uh, Star-Lord, even, from uh, Guardians of the Galaxy fame. That is true. He was originally in magazine form, made his way over into comics. Uh, Rocket Raccoon, as well. So there's a lot of characters you wouldn't expect to be in magazine form. I feel like Marvel really had a handle on the on the magazine format, and DC not so much. Right. Because um, DC was just doing other things. But Marvel really liked their horror, and they really liked their mature lines. So they kept pushing that envelope. They kept, you know, going that route. And I appreciate that from Marvel. But uh, did you have any other offhand that you could think of that you... I mean, there's the most obvious one we already kind of briefly discussed is, you know, what most people are familiar with these days, and that's Walking Dead. Yes, yeah, yeah. But of course, there was a Walking Dead that was for Malibu Comics that, as we discussed in the previous podcast, which had a similar topic with yeah. zombies and whatnot. But of course, everyone's familiar with Kirkman's Walking Kirk Dead. version, yeah. Which, from what I'm told, isn't going away anytime soon. Nope. nope. No. So as long as people keep watching it, they'll keep putting them out there. Yep, yeah, people, as far as the comics are concerned, you know, he has, he does have a set number of issues to go. Yeah, I think he's getting, he's in the 180s. He's getting, creeping up on 200 or something like yeah, that. I, getting, I want to say. Getting I, close. Maybe I, he's 190. I don't know. So I he's think getting up there. 250 may be where he stops. Yeah, you think? Okay. I think he did mention something like that, but I could be wrong. I know he says, you know, there will be an end point. It's not just going to go on forever and ever and ever. There will be an end point. Right. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, he's done some horror stuff. He did the Wolfman thing, the Astonishing Wolfman or whatever, and and a few other titles that, uh, that he very much enjoys. Uh, he did the Demonic Possession and Outcast and a few other things. Um, but, yeah, I think that, that kind of gives a nice little... A little pocket book format story of, of horror comics. All in, brief you know, overview. Yeah, brief overview of, of what you need to know as far as how horror comics came to be. Some of the good ones that you know are pretty recent that you guys should pick up on and check out. And then some, some of the oldies but goodies that, that we think are important as well. And uh, you know some of the smaller publications like Pacific and Eclipse and stuff like that that put out some really good content that you might not know about. So please, uh, you know, look it up and... Uh, you know, if you come across some that you think are cool, let us know. And, you know, we'll check them out. We'll read them. We'll, you know, talk about it. Uh, we could talk about it on the pod or we could talk about it on our YouTube page or our Facebook page as well. Uh, we could talk about it on Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. And we do have our podcast up on iTunes as well. So if you'd like to listen to it there, we will always see you at the comic shop. This has been The Real Short Box. We'll see you at the comic shop. Thanks for listening. 